Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Wednesday, June 1st, 2022. I'm delighted to be here with Professor Roger Knoll. Roger, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. Roger, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? I am a professor emeritus of economics at Stanford University. When did you go emeritus? Um, when I turned 66, uh, 2006. And what have you been doing in the interim? What kind of scholarship are you interested in? My life is, has changed very little between non-retirement and retirement. I've failed retirement miserably. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on right now? Uh, about eight things simultaneously. I'm working on um, a project about decarbonizing the California economy, which is one of my main interests is the economics of regulation. And this is the combined activities of the Public Utilities Commission, the Energy Commission, and the uh, Air Resources Board to make a transition to a 100% electric economy uh, based on uh, renewable electricity generation. So that's project number one, which I'm doing in collaboration with Bruce Kane, who used to be at Caltech and is now at Stanford. Project number two is I have an ongoing interest in the economics of intercollegiate sports. I was an expert witness for the plaintiffs in the antitrust case that was decided a year ago at the Supreme Court in which uh, the NCAA's practices with regard to limiting scholarships were found to be an antitrust violation. And so my one of my interests, I've written a couple of articles about it in the last year, has to do with the future of intercollegiate sports in a world in which the NCAA no longer is uh, setting uniform uh, uh, limits and caps on the compensation of athletes. Um, I'm also I also am working on uh, uh, a project on the end of cap and trade in California, which is uh, uh, forty some years ago at Caltech. We did a research project for the Air Resources Board and the South Coastal Quality Management District, which led to the adoption of Project Reclaim by the South Coastal Quality Management District, which was a, an emissions a cap and trade program for controlling smog. That program is being terminated as of January 1st of next year. And so, and then it turns out that the, the cap and trade, trade program statewide for greenhouse gas emissions is not dead yet, but it's it's on life support at the Air Resources Board. And so I one of my projects, which is just beginning, is to try to figure out uh, the political economy, if you will, because it's not they're not being killed because of poor performance. They're they're being killed for other reasons and uh, having to do with the politics of the incidents of cap and trade programs. And I so I'm I'm just beginning a project to try to figure that out. So that's 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 what I do on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and Thursday I go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> There's the retirement. You wouldn't fish on Thursdays otherwise. <laughs> Roger, let's go all the way back. You're of course an alum of Caltech as well. Tell me about your education in math as an undergraduate, perhaps as an origin story for your later interest in economics. Well. Um... Interestingly enough, my story writ larger uh, is why we have a social science program at Caltech. In my class, six out of the 200 graduates became professors of economics. Uh -huh. All right. And the, the reason for it was that uh, the discipline was undergoing a a big transformation at the time I was an undergraduate, late 50s, early 60s. The discipline of um, math or economics? No, so the economics was becoming much more mathematicalized, both in terms of the use of mathematics to develop theory, and more importantly, from my perspective, the use of statistics. Um, the, the invention of the computer transformed the discipline of economics. We, m most undergraduates at the time I was an undergraduate were, of course, oblivious to this change because uh, the, the formal teaching of economics at the undergraduate level didn't have any of this in it. But being at Caltech, uh, you know, I, I, I 
managed to combine my major in economics with my classes in my major in mathematics with my classes in economics to begin to do things. Uh, uh, a classmate of mine and I did as a research project for one of the courses we took um, an attempt to replicate a paper that was got the Nobel Prize for Robert Solo in, in economics, tried to replicate the results for countries other than the U.S. and found that we couldn't. And uh, that was, you know, so that this idea, this is very Caltechy notion uh, that an undergraduate, uh, you know, uh, a junior undergraduate would go after a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in any case, that was how it all happened. I was a math major, but I was also really interested in the real world. I took a lot of classes in social science and humanities, and including everything that was offered in economics. I still didn't know what I wanted to do as a graduate in for, for graduate school. I, I applied in both mathematics and economics, and, and I ended up deciding at the last possible moment that I was going to go in economics instead of mathematics. I had first said, I'm going to let, I'm going to let my admissions decide. And then I got admitted to all the same schools in both. And then I said, well, I'll let this, I'll let the fellowship money decide. And then I got the same fellowship everywhere. <laughs> so I actually had to eventually pick. And so I picked economics. Roger, if we could zoom out on the undergraduate curriculum. So we all know on the humanities side, that goes back to Caltech's origins. Milliken and Hale yeah. and Noyes, they wanted Caltech undergraduates to be worldly and to take classes in history and literature and things like that. How developed was social sciences at Caltech when you were an undergraduate? Who was teaching those kinds of courses? Actually, the in the lingo of Caltech, in lingua Caltech, Humanities included social science. Uh -huh. So when I, I when the when you go back to origins, when when people like Noyes and and Hale and Milliken used the word humanities, they meant to include social science. So right from the beginning, there were people on the on the Caltech faculty who were actually quite distinguished social scientists. One of them was William Bennett Monroe, who became, you know, president of Stanford, right? Uh, he was a political scientist. So right from the right from the beginning, when when Troop made the transition to Caltech, they had the same basic idea for for social sciences for humanities. All right. What what happened of course, was that after World War II, um, the vision became much more of, of the, the um, stop being of the level of distinction of a William Bennett Monroe. And they started to be people who were primarily teachers. So when I, by the time I got to Tech, there was essentially no one doing research uh, in social science is not only in the humanities. They have been the kinds of people who you would expect to be teaching. Are you having trouble hearing me? Or yeah, the connection seems to be going in and out. Oh, gosh. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's okay now. Okay. So where did you lose me? Um, so let's, let's go back to the, 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 the person who became Stanford professor for Stanford okay. William president. Bennett Monroe. Yeah. William Bennett Monroe was a distinguished political scientist. He was a, a, a nationally renowned scholar in political science. And there were, there were, several people of that stature in the humanities and social sciences at Caltech in the 20s. They, by the, by the time I arrived, they had been replaced by people who you would expect to be on the faculty at Occidental College. Mm -hmm. All right. They were not research scholars. They were primarily teachers. Um, and they, they were not people who were known 
outside of Caltech, with a couple of exceptions. There were, there were like Rod Paul was a distinguished historian of the American West, and Hallett Smith was a distinguished scholar and Shakespeare scholar. But for the most part, the faculty in the division were essentially people who had not pursued a research career. And um, the big transformation that occurred during the period you're mainly focusing on, which is the creation, the change of the name of the division and the creation of the majors in, in social science and the graduate program in social science, they were all an attempt to go back to what it was in the 20s and 30s, which is that the people who were in the division were expected to be just like the scientists and engineers. Roger, do you have a sense of why the program went into some period of decline from the origins of Caltech? It would seem counterintuitive, right? In other words, if it was the founders who considered social science to be part of the humanities, you would expect that that would not have attracted top tier talent to Caltech at that point. Yes, and and uh, obviously it wouldn't attract everybody, but it wouldn't exclude everybody either. All right, and so, so I, I, it was always difficult to find people who were distinguished in in humanities and social scientists who would want to be in the Caltech environment. But on the other hand, there were attractions, right? There were reasons to want to be here. One, incredibly low teaching load, right? Um, not only did you teach fewer classes than you would teach at other schools, but the enrollment in your classes would be much smaller. So teaching was a much better experience, and the, and the students were spent. So that teaching was a more a better experience here than, than almost anywhere else you could go. Uh, uh, secondly, for humanity scholars, there was the Huntington, which is one of the great treasures of in the universe. Uh, to me, I would put the shoe on the other foot. I would say, why in the world for Caltech to start taking advantage of the fact it's walking distance from the Huntington? Right. We, now they do. Right. Uh, but in t until until I became division chair, um, people didn't even attempt to have the scholars at the Huntington be on the Caltech faculty. It was just it was it was a weird phenomenon. And I, and it was such a, an obvious thing to do because, you know, it's the Huntington Laboratory. The Huntington Library is the equivalent of having the. Hail to <laughs> all the huge laboratory facilities at Caltech. It's an incredible attraction to people who are in the right parts of the humanities. And so that I, I can't give you a good explanation for why with this we went through this hiatus, but it was it definitely was there. And indeed, if you read the I know I've read some of the oral histories of faculty in humanities who were the downtrodden. The, the people who were displayed by the revolution that took place. And and their complaint is completely valid. They were hired to do job A and in mid-career it switched to job B. And they felt done in and mistreated. And I understand that. Roger, when you were an undergraduate, was there anything about the math curriculum itself that pulled you into an interest in economics? Or was that mostly coming from you? It all, all, well, it, it, it came from me, but in a broader sense. Remember, go back to what I said. Um, my class was full of people who became economists. Right. <laughs> and it was not only people who actually formally became economists, but other people who, beca had, who, who responded positively to the possibility of making use of mathematical methods and computer technology and natural sciences. So it was it was not it was something we talked about, right? And so it was in the water. As I so I said before, you know, I I did projects with my classmates and we would teach each other because the faculty didn't know what we were doing. And they they encouraged us and they were happy that we were doing it. But uh, you know I, I remember I, when I had 
was a senior and I was had decided I was going to graduate school, I went to one of the faculty in economics and said, you know, what what should I be doing to pre I, I feel somewhat unprepared for in economics, given the limited courses I had. And so he he fished around, you know, he had hadn't been to graduate school for 15 years. So he got some information about what was going on and had me read um, the uh, classic book by Paul Samuelson called Foundations of Economic Analysis, which was is basically the Bible of the introduction of mathematics into economic theory. And we read it together. And I think I taught him more than he taught me because he didn't know the math. And I had to teach it to him for him to be able to understand the book because the book is basically mathematics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that it was a strange phenomenon to, to be in that situation, but it was only possible because of that strange moment in time that social science was undergoing right at the beginning of this transition to his mathematization, which many people, I mean, you know, the, it, both on the part of the of the Cal faculty and in the in the divisional faculty and in, in the people who were already there, they strongly resisted this mathematization, and they, they some of them still don't like it, right? But the point is, in the Cal environment, dealing with the kind of kids you have as Caltech undergraduates, um, you know, it was just great. You know, it was a uh, you could you could you could retain your technical skills and make use of your technical skills and at the same time be interested in something about policy or about how the real world operates, how the businesses operate, how the political system works. You didn't have to pick one or the other. And to us, that was just wonderful. We, we, we had a great time doing that. You obviously had to make that choice, as you said, between math and economics. The fellowships, the admissions wouldn't do that for you. Why ultimately economics? Why ultimately Harvard? Um, well, the, the Harvard part's the easiest because at the time it was clearly number one. All right. It was, uh, there were, there was, uh, and the only, the only thing even close to it was MIT. And I just, and the reason I picked Harvard over MIT is that uh, I already been, and MIT was be like going to Caltech some more. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Harvard simply because it wasn't, it wasn't Caltech. Right. Uh, and uh, so at that time, essentially, the, those were the only choices. If you were a top student, that's where you wanted to go. With regard to why economics, it was just that I asked myself, what are the things you have done in the last two years as an undergraduate that gave you the biggest thrill to do? And it was doing projects in social sciences, not just economics. I mean, psychology, social science as well. But it was it was this this feeling of being on the frontier of a transformation of how social science is done. What were some of the big ideas in economics at Harvard at the time you you, you became a grad student there? Um, there were two things going on, Simon. And I'll, I'll emphasize the methodological one first, because that was by far the most important, that the, the core courses that all students take were, were in front of me tra making this transformation from thing that was words with thick mathematics, all right? And uh, so the, 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 the core micro theory course, the core macro theory course, and then the year of econometrics were all about uh, taking advantage of a new skill set that had only penetrated into economics. <laughs> the reason that econometrics falls the almost impossible to do sophisticated statistics. You couldn't build statistical models on big data sets like the kind the Census Bureau has or something like that. It would take forever. Uh, in my first year of graduate school, we did, were not given access to the Harvard Computer Center. 
uh, uh, we had to do our, our homework problems and econometrics on calculators on not the, not the kind we have today. It looked like mad, mad, gigantic adding machines. And it would take hours to do something very simple. But as an undergraduate at Caltech, I was given access to the Caltech computer system. And the work that I did with my friend on uh, applying the solo growth model to European countries, I was able to, instead of taking three days to, to run a regression, it would take an hour. All right. <laughs> so I knew what was going on and I knew that, that the, the, the constraints I was facing at Harvard were artificial owing to the fact that it was Harvard and they didn't, they weren't treating their students right. Um, so that, that part one, the methodological transformation. Now, in terms of issues of the day were the, the big issues for me were, um, First of all, what are the origins of modern economic growth, which had its manifestation both in economic history and in economic development. So two of the fields that I specialized in as a graduate student at Harvard were economic development and economic history because I was interested in the origins of economic growth. Because again, that relates to this solo article on, on the sources of economic growth in the United States. And um, so that was so a massive change in the few years after I got out of graduate school. So it was really of interesting interest to me. And then the, the, the second major issue, which is related, and I was not a party to it because I wasn't terribly interested in it, was the whole idea of forecasting. That the idea that, that you could build forecasting models, forecast the economy with enough reliability in the next few years so that you could actually do monetary and fiscal policy the way it was suggested in Keynesian economics. Uh, that, you know, in order to in order to have monetary and fiscal policy that is counter cyclical, you have to be able to predict the cycles. And that was essentially impossible until the 1960s because it required computer analysis of data. Now that was that was a hot topic. I, I wasn't part of it because I decided I wasn't particularly interested in macro, but that occupied a significant fraction of my, my colleagues <laughs> at Harvard. Your time at Harvard was on the early side of the 1960s and all of the political tumult, but were you politically conscious? Were you politically engaged? Did that influence the kind of scholarship you wanted to pursue in graduate school? Um, no, it's, it, it, it should have, but it, it didn't. I mean, uh, um, I, I, when I was at Harvard, the big issue was the war in Vietnam. And uh, I did things, you know, I was, I, I was very much involved uh, in the students' side, uh, protesting the war in Vietnam and the draft. And um, yeah, so I, I was aware of that. And then of course, it was sort of the, the, in addition to that, the civil rights movement was going on, which brought attention to distributional issues. Where, and again, interested and supportive, but I didn't, I didn't connect it to my own research prep plan. What happened with, when I got out of graduate school, I, you know, I, I finished my dissertation at Caltech, which for a strange reason, which is, this faculty member that I was telling you about, where we worked together, Samuelson's Foundation, he died of a massive heart attack mm -hmm. in the spring of 1965 when I was just finishing my third year of graduate school. And Alan Sweezy called me up and said, as an emergency measure, could you come and replace him and teach classes next year? Because it's too late in the year for us to replace him with anybody good. And so I agreed to do it. So I came without my dissertation being finished. As I was finishing my dissertation in that next year, which was highly mathematical and theoretical, um, I realized that, that that wasn't why I had become an economist, uh, to prove more theorems. Uh, that would have been the natural thing to do if I was a mathematic. Right. <laughs> but I had left the fact that I had an advantage over most of my fellow students in mathematics drive and dictate my research program. So what I did, you know, in the fall of 66 uh, was contact 
um, uh, a, a faculty member at Harvard for whom I had been a teaching assistant, who by that time was now at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, what working for working for um, Lyndon Johnson and said, would you hire me to be a staff member? Because uh, I really want to get, I want to make a transformation where I'm not a theorist, I'm doing em empirical policy work. And so he, he, he brought me to DC as a, a staff member at the Council of Economic Advisors. And that's where all of my current research interests come from, was the well, year and a half I spent in the White House in uh, Washington. How mathematical was your thesis retrospectively? In other words, looking back, was it as mathematical as it should have been? Um, no, it was the it was the appropriate level of mathematics for the topic at hand. What my dissertation was about was economic applications of some techniques in in operations research. And mathematics and uh, that were are closely related to but not the same as linear programming and nonlinear programming it's essentially optimization models um, uh, applied to to such thing as the design of military weapons systems and large-scale complicated projects where there's a lot of uncertainty about how long and how expensive each component of the task is likely to be and what's the what is the right way to manage such a program in a flexible way so that as you progress, the differential luck and rates of progress uh, cause you to reallocate your resources in an optimal way. That was what my dissertation was about. And whereas there were some examples in it of applications, it was basically mathematics. And uh, so, you know, it, wasn't, it was never problematic that I'd get my degree but it wasn't, when I was done with it, I thought, you know, yeah, <laughs> why did I spend two years of my life doing this? So when you came to Caltech initially in 65, it was as an instructor, it was not tenure track. No, I was, and it, my intention was not that I was going to stay there. Uh, I, it was, it, and then it was, it was, it was prior to my making any decision about what I was going to do as a career. And indeed, meanwhile, back at the ranch, during my entire graduate school period, I was also working at Honeywell as a computer programmer. Um, and so I was working on a project there to develop the, the Fortran, if you remember Fortran, sure. the Fortran compiler for Honeywell computers competitor to the IBM system 360. And I was one of 25 people working on this Fortran compiler as a part-time job while I was a graduate student. And I, so at that time, it's, it was a perfectly plausible outcome for me would have been to go into the computer. Um, and so I didn't really know. I didn't, I, I never had a strong specific occupational goal. I was mainly just doing things I liked to do and and would get then could get rewarded for. And that's why, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was gonna do. And when I took came to Caltech to do teaching, my expectation was I'd finish my dissertation and then I'd decide what I was gonna do based on what the what the job market told me I should do. And so I would keep open all my options. And then, you know, the explanation for the, the the going to Washington to work at the CEA was that was another educational experience that would determine my, my career. And I didn't really think that I would necessarily come back to Caltech. I, you know, it was like I knew I had that option because I, you know, they wanted me to come back. But um, while I was there, I did the normal job market thing. I interviewed at other schools and looked around at what my possibilities were, uh, looked around at the possibility of staying in government, and uh, I mean, maintain contact with my group at Honeywell. Uh, so all these options were still there. And uh, um, it wasn't until pretty much near the end of my period in D.C. that I decided to come back to Caltech. Roger, as an instructor, the initial appointment, what you were saying earlier about 
as an undergraduate, the teach the faculty in social science, they were primarily teaching faculty. Did that was that a retrospective observation? Did you understand that in sharper focus when you were there as an instructor from sixty five to sixty seven? Oh, I understood that completely, but I, they knew that I wasn't that way. Uh huh. All right. And uh, and in particular, the my my main mentor, who's Alan Sweezy, wasn't that way. Alan was a was a was he wasn't at the very top of the profession. But he was a good, solid, when he was still in the main academic mainstream, he was a macroeconomist. And then he got interested in population issues. And he became a leader in that field, sort of internationally recognized, uh, uh, a leader of Planned Parenthood and someone who did research on population and environment and, and resources and all that. So he, he knew that I was going to be more like that, more like him than like the normal faculty member. And, and when I was brought back to teach, the decision had already been made to have an economics major. And that, that meant having people there who could teach it in the modern way, in the, in the contemporary way. So when I was brought in, it was in part that I wasn't going to teach. I was going to teach introductory economics, which is the, one of the courses that was taught by Mel Brocky, the guy that I replaced. But I was also going to, for the first time, teach undergraduate microeconomic theory and econometrics the way I had been taught it at graduate school, which is with math. That's the first time that math was actually used in undergraduate economics classes at Caltech. Roger, what did you do at the CEA? What were your projects? Um, when I arrived, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I sort of was given every, all the things that nobody else was interested in. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, the range of my, it was, it was, it was almost like dying and going to heaven. Right. Um, one of the areas was anything having to do with antitrust and regulation, public policy towards business. So I was, I, and there was, not only was there no staff person who had any background or interest in that area, none of the three members of the Council of Economic Advisors had that as an interest. They were all macroeconomists, all right? Uh, and so uh, I, I would, anything having to do with regulatory policy was mine. It was, it was, you dealt with me, and then if you wanted to go around me, you had to go all the way to the White House, I think of the president. <laughs> so that was one area. Another one was education policy. There was nobody interested in that. So I did that. A third one was uh, income maintenance, welfare, you know, Social Security, all that. And so now that's a pretty big hunk of what the government does, those three things. And so right off the top, uh, you know, I... I remember that the day I arrived uh, to check in uh, and went to say hello to the person I was going to be working for, Jim Dusenberry from Harvard. He said, "Well, you're just in time. We have a crisis." And I and he says, "I have no way how to deal with this. I need you to figure it out for me." Which is um, the the railroad unions are about to go on strike. And they, both the unions and the railroads have asked to enjoin the strike through the Taft-Hartley Act. And so the question we have, you know, just, and we assume the answer is like everybody before us for the past 20 years, we should enjoin the strike and invoke the Taft-Hartley Act. But just to be sure, check it out. And by the end of the day, come to us with a recommendation. So. I, you know, here I am. I didn't. I didn't even know what the Taft Hartley Act was. <laughs> I didn't even know the president had the power to enjoin a strike. So I, I just, I, I just started calling people, and and I was told the magic secret. This is from the White House. I'd like to ask you a few questions. <laughs> and of course, when you call someone in the government, that gets their attention. <laughs> and by by the end of the day, I went into his office and I said. I am not done yet. Give me another day because I think the right answer to the question is we shouldn't do it. Just let them strike. All right. And so I gathered a bunch of information. 
Uh, and then by the end of the second day, I had something concrete, which is literally nothing because of stockpiles and and uh, uh, the dip, the and inventories. The the very first thing that's going to happen bad, that's bad if a, a strike is in 26 days the city of Cincinnati is going to run out of chlorine for its water system. <laughs> that's how specific it was. So I said, let them strike and then invoke it. 20 days into it. All right. And so I went to the White House with my friend who was my TA that I had TA for and went to the uh, chief of staff, Joe Califano, and uh, we made the case to him. He said, This is fascinating. And so then we made the, pres the case to the president and he said, This is fascinating. He says, Yeah, let's, let's just not invoke it. So we, he issued a press release that it's time that labor and management the rail industry should grow up and learn how to solve their own problems. They don't need the help of the president. Go ahead and strike if you want. Well, the next day they settled. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they and both of them were just shocked that that the that the federal government uh, wasn't going to give them uh, a mandatory arbitrated outcome that they actually would have to decide things on their own. So it worked. It was a great success. <laughs> that was my first job. Roger, looking looking back, what what Dealing do you, with the entire looking back, what what do you think the the this experience had in your approach to scholarship? How did it change the kinds of things you wanted to work on? Well, I knew what my interests were. I didn't know how to formulate a good policy question. All right. And the, the year and a half I spent at the Council of Economic Advisor taught me that because the first the first four or five publications I had, after, uh, you know, remember I received my PhD two weeks before I showed up at the Council of Economic Advisors. All right, so I had my my career fork at that moment was shall I polish off two or three chapters of my dissertation for articles in, in theory journals, or shall I just completely change and start over? And I picked the start over branch. And the first two or three articles, I first four articles I published were written research papers driven by a policy topic. And uh, and that what I, the skill that I learned and I, that, that affected the rest of my career was knowing how to identify a policy problem that real world people were facing that had a researchable inter, uh, issue at its core and how to connect the design of a research program to something useful to make a policy decision. And that, that was the, that, that skill was what I learned from a whole sequence of projects that included they, they included the railroad strike. They included the the design of the public broadcasting system. They included the what uh, the attempt to bring the uh, negative income tax into the welfare system, which eventually did happen in a truncated way in the earned income tax credit. Um, it had it came through the beginning of deregulation of, uh, of economic regulation and telecommunications and rails and trucks and all that. So all those issues were on the table as policy issues in the White House at the time I was at the CEA. And I was fortunate enough that I was assigned to be the CEA person who did those things. Um, and each one of those topics then generated a research question that I could attack as a staff member, but that also was crucial to the design of the policy. Roger, coming back to Caltech, joining the faculty as a tenure track a, a professor, did you know at the outset that you would have a larger program in front of you? In, in other words, not just your own career, but building up the program at Caltech as you wanted to see it happen. I knew that, that there was going to be such an attempt, that it was not known at the time what it would look like. And there were multiple ways it could have gone. And there was 
there was a competition uh, among various groups as to how it would go. But everybody um, agreed that it had to go someplace. By the time, by yeah, by the time I returned from the Council of Economic, Advi Economic Advisors, the die had been cast. Once you decide you're going to have a PhD program, you have to have a research program. So, what insight did you have on that decision, given that you were not part of it? How did that happen? Um, well, it's not quite true. I wasn't part of it. I certainly wasn't in any way a decider. I didn't have a vote, but I was asked about it. And even before that, it was we. I knew it was going to happen before I left. All right. That is to say, the second year I spent as an instructor was the first year of the great debate about what form it would take, and we began to interview people because I, I, you know, it wasn't it wasn't viable in the long run that there'd be exactly one person on the faculty who could teach a modern economic theory course or a modern statistics course. So we knew we had to hire people in, who could teach theory, who could teach econometrics, and who could teach some of the applied fields, right, in applied microeconomics fields. And so the issue that was just beginning to be enjoined then was who these people would be and what their interests would be. And, and I, so in that, in that second year as an instructor, several people that I knew were invited to come and give talks at Caltech and to talk to faculty about where they thought we should go. And then when I then left to go to the CEA, that continued for another couple of years. And by the time I came back, it was still not obvious what it was going to be. Um, and in particular, how the, the, the substitution, uh, the elimination of macroeconomics and the infusion of political science into the core curriculum of the graduate program, that that was just, you know, that but that was still up for grabs. How you do that when I came back from the CEA? The, when the the, the 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 you know the um, the the first hires in political science were done in the early seventies. And I came back for the CEA in January 69. So, Roger, the timing, the decision to have PhDs in economics predates the creation of HSS? The change in the name came about as a result of the decision to have degrees, both undergraduate and graduate in social science. In other words, the argument Contrary to a lot of stuff that people say, if you were actually at the meeting <laughs> when the name change happened, the reason for it was just simple. If we change the name to humanities and social science, it's going to be a lot easier to recruit social scientists because they don't regard themselves as humanists. Yeah. Even though in the Caltech lexicon, right, humanities includes social science. In the larger world, it doesn't, and it's going to be easier for us to become visible and to become uh, a player in in political economy, which was what we had decided to do, if the name is different. Now, a question I'm always interested in, in making this decision to have a PhD program for social science, why not for humanities also? The humanists didn't lobby for it. And I, I agree with you, it's a strange choice because again, with the Huntington, uh, Having a, a, a doctoral program in, human, in, in a humanities discipline that was closely related to what the Huntington's collections are about made eminent good sense. But the argument against it was that it that you never could have a big enough faculty uh, because the number of the number of things you would need to teach is just too great. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, to this day, don't know how valid that is. I think it's probably valid for literature but it's not clear it's valid for history because the social science part has done, you know, has had a sequence of, of graduate students who earned PhDs who do economic and political history. So, uh, you know, I, why there couldn't have been a social history component as well, I don't know. It seems to me it was that, that the argument for a history graduate program is equally good as the argument for a social science graduate program. See, now I would have thought that the case that would have been made at the time is that social science is science 
And so therefore, a place like Caltech should have graduate students in social science, just like it does in biology and chemistry and physics. Interestingly enough, <laughs> nobody put it that way. That wasn't the argument at the time. Fascinating. Uh, the argument at the time was uh, there's this thing out there called deductive logic, which is the foundation for research, no matter what the topic is. C.P. Snow was not a popular person in the division in the 1960s. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it was the, the, the notion of two cultures. There's a sciencey way to do things and a humanities way to do things was not at the forefront of the debate because most of the people in the division didn't agree with that. All right. So when you get back to Caltech from Washington, who who's driving these discussions? Where are they happening? Well, this was right in the middle of of a jockeying for position among you know, the, 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 there, there were a bunch of things going on simultaneously. The, the, the topical orientation, all right, was one of them was what actually happened, which is interdisciplinary work in social science that has a policy orientation, but that is methodologically rigid, rigorous, all right? And that's the one that eventually won. But I didn't think in 1969-70 that was the likely winner, all right, even though that was my preference. And then one of the reasons I went to Brookings and didn't come back for three years is I didn't think that uh, my way of doing that stuff was actually going to win. Um, another one was uh, was national security issues. And indeed, when Harold Brown became president of Caltech, I pretty much thought that would be the winner. <laughs> and uh, it was and at that at that time, you know, again, the, the Rand Corporation connection through Bert Klein was really important because the Rand Corporation was the center of the universe in McNamara style national security analysis. That had and, not been discredited at that point, at least at Caltech. No. And uh, so the, the, the issue of the analytics of deterrence and national security and arms control and all that, that was that was probably the leading candidate uh, circa 1970 to be the winner all right roger what was the paper trail once these decisions were made how does the process of creating hss get formalized is there a white paper is there a faculty vote what does it look like so what happens the the, the division was highly undemocratic uh, you know, Hallett Smith ran the division as division chair. And so when, when Bob Huttenbach replaced him, he loosened it somewhat and democratized it somewhat. But it was only going from a dictatorship to an oligarchy. <laughs> uh, it didn't become a democracy until later. <laughs> and so this was and this is consistent with the history of Caltech. You know, you didn't have a committee decide uh, to build the uh, the telescope on Mount, the hundred inch telescope on Mount Wilson. You had George Ellery Hill decide, <laughs> and Millikan decided physics. <laughs> so the idea, you know, it's not surprising that's the way things were done because governance at Caltech was very hierarchical in, in the early years of its history and the division was similar. So what would happen is you'd show up to work one day and there'd be a new faculty member. When, like when Bert Klein was hired, I didn't find out about it until after he'd agreed to come, right? And likewise, when Lance Davis was hired, I didn't find out about it until after he would agreed to come. There was no consultation, nothing. It's just that the division chair decided he'd hire somebody. And uh, so one of the major transformations that occurred, um, you know, in that, that happened because when Huttenbach replaced uh, uh, Hallett Smith was, was to change the appointment process into the kind of process that is used at peer institutions, you know, where you have, you have committees 
they review multiple candidates, they write a report, they ask for outside recommendations or letters of evaluation where they compare candidates. Um, and you do that outside of the, of the, of the knowledge and, and input of the person you're recruiting. And you, you don't, you don't evaluate just one person. You have a list of finalists and you have, you, you compare them both you and you ask other people on the out. That whole process of how you do appointments was invented at Caltech in the early seventies. It wasn't used until then. And that's why I was hired myself is, uh, you know, Alan Sweezy goes to Hallett and says, well, Mel Brockie's dead. Let's get Roger to come back and teach his courses. And, uh, and it wasn't, there was, there was no formal review or anything. And that, so that's why it was always so much in doubt what was going to happen. You had, uh, you know, you had this policy oriented, methodologically strong uh, social science thing that it actually became national security, population and environment, uh, science policy was another one. Um, so you had, magical people apply like John, you know, appear like John Holdren, uh, who just appeared and was on the faculty one day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was, it, and there was another one that had to do with development economics, uh, that um, the instigators of which, the main leader of which was Bob Oliver. And so I didn't know as a, as, as a 20 something, you know, fresh PhD, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on, and I just knew that a, that a, this debate was going on about what the future should be. And actually, initially, Bob Huttenbeck was part of the development, uh, the the, the um, developing countries uh, orientation. And I remember the the year before I went to the Council of Economic Advisors, we had a year long seminar where everybody who, you know, was asked to, to participate in essentially a year long seminar series on the, the, on poor countries, how to, how to stop poor countries from being poor. And that was a candidate for what the theme would be of the social science program. In making this decision, what was the response of the administration, the provost, the president, the board of trustees, how did they react to these developments? Well, it depends completely on who the president was. Um, you know, so the the relevant presidents for this history are DuBridge and then Harold Brown and then Murph Goldberger. And there, you couldn't ask for three more different people, right? Um, I, I think, you know, DuBridge had no clue what we were doing or why we were doing it. And he was, he essentially just trusted that his provost, Bob Bacher, would just tell him what to do that would work. And Bacher likewise had no clue, except for the fact he as a scientist had been deeply involved in policy. So he was, he was amenable to these policy oriented themes, but I didn't, I had no idea, which I, I suspected he would have preferred the national security one because that's where his background was. Did you engage Bacher at all in, in his policy work? Did you learn about what he had done earlier in his career? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, have you gotten into this? A little bit, but I'm curious what conversations you might've had with him. Oh, very little. I mean, I maybe twice we had a five minute conversation about it. And, but he was, you know, it was all positive, but you know, he was just giving his input and talking to me and asking questions and that kind of stuff, but it was very informal and it had no obvious endpoint. you know? Yeah. They were just conversations. Roger, what about the board of trustees? Any insight into how they felt about this development? Um, only later, not at, not at the, not, I didn't have any significant contact with the trustees at this time. I didn't have any significant contact with the trustees until I came back from Brookings. What about other divisions? In other words, today, if it's so normal on campus for there to be collaborations between the yes. economics, the economists and the neuroscientists, was that part of it as well? Were there sort of interdisciplinary collaborations that were already bubbling up at that point? 
especially in the environment area. Uh huh. That my first two graduate students at Caltech were actually students in environmental engineering. They were in the basically the civil engineering department of the School of Engineering. One of the advantages of Caltech is its complete lack of formal formal organization. So I, you know, I didn't have any graduate students in economics, but I had graduate students in engineering. All right, and uh, uh, so my my very first paper in the American Economic Review is col my collaborator is a person who was at that time a graduate student in civil engineering who was one of my phd students so you know it's um to me that was i didn't know it at the time because i wasn't experienced enough but that was a unique feature of caltech was you know i i it certainly would never have been the case at stanford right that uh, uh that i would have graduate students in the school of engineering as a as a junior faculty member <laughs> in economics, it just wouldn't happen at Stanford. Roger, how did these developments affect your own research? What were you working on at this time, and how did you benefit by having the creation of HSS? Well, the as I said before, the the, the, the I had a number of things that I did uh, as a consequence of being at the CEA. Uh, one of which was uh, involvement in uh, income distribution issues. And in that context, uh, one of a couple of the first papers I wrote were on urban, rural urban migration and north south, south north migration in the US. Uh, and, you know, do they, did it make people better or worse that this was going on? And that was, so there was that, that caused me in the economics profession initially to be thought of as an urban economist, because I was doing research about how cities develop and how the distribution of employment differs from the distribution of residency in metropolitan areas and how that's affected by policies like highway policies and all that kind of stuff. So but for the first couple of papers I wrote were on that topic. And it came directly out of a task force that I was working on, a presidential task force, when I was at the CEA. And that basically never had any further Caltech implications. But the one that had the Caltech implication, and it's still having implications actually, was the design of the public broadcasting system. Because the uh, the the I was on the committee that set up the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The, the act that created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was passed during in the Johnson administration era when I was at the CEA. And I was put on a five person committee to organize what became CPB and PBS. And <clears throat> that there, there's an appendix to our report about how one decides what the program content would be <clears throat> on a public broadcasting system, given that you want it to be have a be a major player in public information, you know, uh, you want it to do news programs and documentaries, but you don't want that to become politicized. So, how do you design a program selection process that will make it immunized against political interference? And well, that task force report proposed the outlines of a decentralized mechanism for picking programming content uh, <clears throat> where the stations collectively would make, you had to, would make collective choice decisions, sort of like political decisions in a decentralized fashion about what the programs would be. And that eventually became something called the station program cooperative. Uh, in public broadcasting, which means that when a member of Congress doesn't like a program, he doesn't have anybody to call <laughs> who could actually change it because it was selected by 155 program managers of the PBS system operating in a computer driven <coughs> program selection process. This likewise, uh, 
the whole idea of emissions trading that we did, we were talking about earlier, again, is how do you design a market-like mechanism, a collective choice institution to achieve a policy objective uh, in a decentralized fashion? Um, that became the whole idea of market design, which is now a field in economics. It wasn't the field in economics in 1970. And it's what a lot of the experimental work at Caltech has been about. A lot of Charlie Plott's work is about market design. When Vernon Smith was at Caltech, you know, he essentially won the Nobel Prize for his market design work about treasury auctions, using experimental methods to test ways of doing treasury bill auctions. So that part really did become a big component of what the social science program at Caltech is all about. When you were at Brookings, what was your status at Caltech? Were you on leave? Were you dual hatted? How did that work? I left. I was on leave the first year, and then I quit. I resigned because I decided to stay at Brookings permanently, and and then I was brought back. Uh, remember, I said it was all up for grabs when Caltech hired <clears throat> two people that I had recru recruited in political science and who I thought were not gonna get jobs there. Then I agreed to come back. Uh, that was John Fair, John and Mofi Arena. Did you enjoy your time at Brookings? Was that an intellectual oh, I stimulating? I still love Brookings. Brookings is, Brookings is it's, not, it's not like it was then, but- um, What does that mean? What was it like then? How is it different now? The, ma the main difference now is that it's, it's due to the nature of the financing of research. Brookings is much less wealthy as an institution. And as a result, they don't have the caliber of staff top to bottom that they did when I was there. All right. That is to say, if Brookings had been an academic economics department, the, the economics component or the political science component, the government studies component, had they been departments of economics or political science, they would have ranked in the top 10 national. All right. That's not true now. It would probably be 25th or 30th. All right. But at the time, some of the genuine superstars who, who in economics who whose work is especially plugged into policymaking, were on the staff at Brookings. And so that's what made it attractive. It was, it was uh, like being in a top department, except that everyone around you is interested in policy applications. Whereas at that time, if you'd gone to MIT or Harvard or Chicago, most of the faculty would, would have been writing for their colleagues, not writing for policy. As a potential permanent career move, as you saw it at the time, were you okay with not having students, not teaching, shedding that area of your professional responsibilities? No, I mean, that's the, one of the, but by, by the time I came back, there was a PhD program. I, when I came back, it was to interact with the first cohort of PhD students. No, I did, I, I would, one of the reasons I resigned was I didn't think that was going to happen. I wonder, and you're not the person to ask, obviously, but I wonder if luring you back was one of the tipping points, the causes for creating the PhD oh, program. I don't think so. No, I think I think it was going to succeed. I think the crucial decisions were uh, basically hiring uh, Fair John of Arena. I think that was the crucial decision that guaranteed that Caltech was going to succeed, and. At the time, it wasn't obvious because <clears throat> political science was undergoing the same transformation in the 1970s that economics went through in the 1950s. All right. It was the, just the very beginning of formalization and rigor in political science research. And Mo and John were in the first generation of people who did that. And when Caltech hired them, it was it had committed itself to this radical transformation of political science that had just begun. And uh, at the time, it was highly controversial. People at the leading political science departments thought we were crazy. All right. So we were, 
in, it, it, it's, it's strange looking back on all the members of the National Academy of Sciences and Political Science who were at Caltech in the 70s. Those people were not offered jobs at the top universities because it was not regarded as where as what was the mainstream of political science. So, you know, it's uh, today someone of the caliber of Fair John and Fiorina would have be offered a job in every department in the country. But at that time, there wasn't much competition for them. There were there was there was University of Rochester and Carnegie Mellon were the only universities, the research universities that were hiring people like that. And of course, that we 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 could compete easily against them, you know. So I think that those that was the crucial hire. The, the that that it was necessary to be able to hire Dave Grether and Jim Quirk and people who would teach core theory and econometrics. All right. Uh, certainly hiring hiring Charlie Plot. And uh, ha even though we never, he never came permanently, having Vernon Smith hang around a lot, he was, you know, there half the time for several years. That created this, this, this experimental uh, base, which turned out to be extremely important because, again, like the political science story, it was regarded as a strange, un uh, unpromising uh, part of economics at the time these people came. But, you know, 20 years later, it's generating Nobel Prizes. And that, that's, that was, so I regard those as all being tied together. That if, that putting money in experimental methods when nobody thought it was gonna matter, putting money into formalization and rigor in political science when nobody thought that was gonna matter, uh, and, and emphasizing that the whole point of the rigor is to solve real world problems. They were all part of the same package. And, and it was the success in hiring people to do that and to create a critical mass of people who did it that made it successful. Your first three major book projects were all published by Brookings. Was that part of the deal? Were you supposed to publish with Brooks while you're there, Brookings while you're there? Um, the basic rule of thumb at Brookings is a book every two years. With Brookings Press, that's the that's yeah. the deal. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no, but, but yeah, you're you. That's your job is to generate a book a book every two years for the Brookings Press. Were you more productive there? Do you think than you would have been had you just stayed on the faculty at Caltech? It would have been different. All right, I mean, if you. So I re let's go back to your three books. One of them was Economic Aspects of Television Regulation, which is probably, um, you know, that that m made me a player in the field of regulation. More, than, re more than reforming regulation. Yes, more, much more so. That was a project that grew out of being at the Council of Economic Advisors, being involved in the creation of the public broadcasting system. All right, the, by the time that I left, the, the, the member in charge of that part of the Council of Economic Advisors portfolio was Joe Peck, who was a co-author on this book. And we decided while I was at the CEA that we were going to write that book, all right? And so that is classic CEA, mainstream economics all right so caltech had nothing to do with that <laughs> i would have done it no matter what brookings caltech mars <laughs> now reforming regulation uh is a classic brookings tale um the the uh i get a phone call from the president of brookings saying the president task force on regulatory reform is issuing a report we uh you have been hired to be in charge of the regulation program at brookings uh why don't you organize a conference based on this report and i said okay and i organized a conference and then when i 
when the report actually came out, I thought it was completely crazy. And so I wrote what became this small book that's called a staff paper. It's about 120 pages long, something like that, basically criticizing it for missing the boat. And but that was purely Brookings. I never would have done that in a million years had I not been at Brookings because it was a response to a short term salient political issue that um, would never have happened at Caltech or any other university. It's in, and the only reason it, it hit home to me was that it, it was right at the nexus of this thing we were talking about before vis-a-vis -vis Caltech, the, inter the, the intersection between economics and political science and policy, right? And so it was dealt to my natural interest and strength. And then the third one was the book on sports, the, which by far is the most citations, mm -hmm. right? Because of, of the nature of sports and society. And that came about simply because um, uh, very soon after arriving at Brookings, uh, I got a phone call from a staff guy in the Senate saying that the, uh, the, the two competing professional basketball leagues had asked for an antitrust exemption to allow them to merge. And would I help them organize some hearings on that? And after going through the hearings process, the organization of the hearings, I then went to Brookings and said, this is a field that is really potentially interesting and I want to have a conference about it and here are the people I'm going to invite, but I need money to be able to pay them to write the papers and to hold the conference. And so again, that was classic Brookings. I probably never would have done it had it not been for the phone call from a Senate staffer saying, help us organize some hearings. But on the other hand, I had to get interested in it as well. And, uh, uh, you know, so it played to an interest I had, which is the role of competition in the economy and um, and the dislike for cartels. Bruce, give, uh, Roger, given the fact that there were so many things that were happening at Caltech when you got back, what what aspects do you feel were already completed and where was there still building mode? Where was there opportunity for you to contribute to what was happening in these formative years? Well, um, one of the, you know, I, I organized a, a, a fairly large fraction of the research when I first came back for the first years after I came back, that there weren't very many faculty and a lot of them were junior. And so uh, because of my Washington experience, I, I better than anybody else on the faculty could tap into the policy oriented research programs being financed by the federal government. So the, at the time, the National Science Foundation had a program called Research Applied to National Needs, which almost nobody knew about except me, right? And I was able to get several grants, uh, large grants, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars in 1970 dollars, that each one of which supported four or five graduate students. And uh, so uh, the the bookends for that, the first one was something about uh, the last one was the one about designing the uh, air pollution market for Los Angeles. And then there were two or three in between where, so maybe half to two thirds of the graduate students during the first five years I was there were being paid from my, out of my grants. So I think that's the main way that I influenced how the program developed was that, you know, simply I was the one dealing with so many of the graduate students. What research did you take on? Your next monograph didn't happen for a few years. What were you working on when you returned to Caltech? Well, if you, yeah, my, my publications were mainly um, articles. journal articles. Right. Yeah. And that's where I developed 
my collaboration with the political scientists. I had several articles that I wrote either with Fair John or Fiorina. So that was the whole idea of <clears throat> formalizing the political economy literature. You know, um, I did I did some experimental stuff because you couldn't be at Caltech and not do that. Um, and the the station program cooperative produced like four or five articles um, where that where it was transformed into the next level of generality, which is decentralized acquisition of public goods, common goods. So that was another part of the program. Um, I'm having trouble without having my CV in front of me. Remember, I what mean, they you all did are. you did a lot. You did a lot during those years. Yeah, I did. A lot. Oh, oh, there was also this. That was the origin. That was the period of the origin of my interest in administrative law, about the sort of law and economics of administrative law, and that that began in that period as well, which led to the single biggest cited work that I have, which is you know the it's called McNoll Gas, McCubbins Knoll and Wine Gas. McCubbins and Wine Gas were graduates late 70s early 80s and we wrote a series of papers on on uh, uh, the sort of formal positive social science theory of administrative law in the courts and that gets thousands of citations so that and, because, and the reason is that it it appeals to scholars in, in in three disciplines economics political science and law now, during this time, were you starting to get recruitment office offers away from Caltech? Oh yeah, no, we we were yeah. I mean, it didn't take it didn't take long at all. It only took two or three years for the rest of the world to figure out we were onto something, right? Because I mean, both both Fairjohn and Fiorina were gone by the early eighties, right? And uh, so, if you, if you think of it, look at who was on the Caltech faculty in the nineteen seventies. There's almost nobody staying, right? And so we went from being pariahs, people who were doing something that was unimportant, to being people who go anywhere we want within a few years. So it was a, it was a great selection of an orientation of a, of a program that is exactly consistent with the whole Catholic ethos. You have a small group that goes off and tries to do something that everybody thinks is crazy, and then they do it. Right. And that so it was it was and it was very much a team game. Right. It was not you can't point to any single person and say they were the crucial part. It was it was a group of people who had the crazy overconfidence that you get you have in your youth that you know, that you could actually do something. And the fact that nobody's done it in the past hundred years doesn't mean that it must be stupid <laughs> so yeah no it was that was it was a great environment it was a camelot period at caltech and the, what we were doing was unique and we went from nobody cared what we were doing to everybody cared why do you think that is what's the big takeaway what was so unique about the research that was happening at caltech that resonated how it did when it did Well, I, in the end, I think it's you, you just have to say it was because there were certain kinds of questions that people had not gotten much traction on historically that were made feasible as research projects that could produce a useful output, uh, that they didn't become feasible until the time. Remember, a lot of this is history in the sense that you can't have a Caltech program with its or with its data drivenness without computers. And the theoretical foundations are game theory, and that wasn't invented until the 60s. So there's there's no way you could have done the Caltech program prior to the 1970s. It just it wouldn't have been possible. And so we were just positioned uh, well. To, to be in an environment where we could take advantage 
uh, of those things happening in the outside world and apply them to a, a new product. And the, you know, the, it didn't really matter what the output was because it was new. It's, you know, it's, I, I frequently say this to my graduate students. If you happen to fall upon a brand new data set, there's nothing bad that could come out from being the first person <laughs> to analyze a, a big new complex data set. It, no matter what you get, it's going to be just fine. <laughs> and that's sort of the game we were in that, that uh, I don't think it was predictable precisely how the, the program would produce the influential scholars that it produced in the 70s, both junior faculty becoming senior faculty and graduate students being trained, you know, they're in roughly equal measure. I mean, Caltech produced an enormous number of graduate students in economics and political science that became highly distinguished scholars with appointments at top five departments in economics and political science that that no, no one would have dreamed in 1970 that an unranked school in economics and political science could by 1980 be producing some of the best graduate students in the country and have some and have several faculty members elected to the national academies All right, it's just you, that just doesn't happen you know historically it doesn't happen but it but notice how it parallels the history of the sciences at Caltech. It's exactly what happened there. It's, you know, a, a physicist decides he wants to do genetics, right? That's so Caltech. <laughs> you know, and he, uh, why would a physicist believe he could do genetics? Right? <laughs> That's great. Roger, how well did, did HSS replenish when you know these other programs started to recruit away some of the top people at Caltech. Well, I, you know it's, it's interesting. Caltech, I think, always will have this problem that if you, the best thing that can happen to an idea is for it to flourish in the greater academic, what he is doing. It's completely natural that, that others are going to value it. And it may well be that the socially optimal distribution across universities of the people that were at Caltech in the 70s is for them now to be spread all over the universe, to, to, to have more students have access to it, to train more students, have expose themselves to a broader academic community. So I don't think of this as ne in a negative way. It means the job of the division chair is especially hard because you've got to you've got to do a good job replenishing people, right? You have to get yourself into the mindset that as long as we are innovative and not just doing what everybody else is doing. Uh, we're going to lose a large fraction of our people. And I mean, I, I've talked to, to John Laurent uh, about this. You know, he, his, his, he regards making certain that the, the 30 year olds he hires are the, the people who are going to be the 50 year olds that he's losing. And that, that's a tough job. And, but that's what, that's what you have to do. If you're going to be innovative and doing things that are different, you just, that's just the way life is that you the, the 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 indicator of your your success is that somebody you hired for whom you had no competition when they were 30 suddenly gets offers at every university in the country when they're 40 that is a great measure of your success when did you start to think seriously about leaving caltech what were some of the offers that were really interesting to you um well, I, the leaving of Caltech part was mainly about not wanting to stay on after not being division chairman. All right. Uh, the the first year after I was division chair was from hell. Which, what what year was that? Was, when did you start? Uh, I stopped being division chair in 82, in the summer of 82. And the academic year, 82, 83, I was still on campus. I And that year was hell 
all right? Because everybody wanted me to carry their water in battles with my successor, um, with the provost, you know, I was, they were, I was getting involved and I didn't want to, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I never envisioned myself as a permanent academic administrator. I viewed myself as someone who was dealing with a short-term problem. All right. And so the idea that I was going to be pulled into all these crazy battles going on that are not very important in the long run as a permanent thing just drove me nuts. So, but when I, you know, when I, when I went away, I actually, I actually thought what I would do. I knew I didn't want to leave California. All right. And I thought I was probably come back to UCLA, not Caltech, because that the the best offer I had then was uh, UCLA. Uh, and then when I went to Stanford, um, the uh, Don Kennedy became president, and Jim Ross, who was the person in the economics department at Stanford, who was in my field, antitrust and regulation, um, became the provost. And so all of a sudden, magically this position opened up in the department and within a few weeks after I arrived, they started recruiting me to replace Jim in the, in the economics department. And that's why I stayed at Stanford was, you know, it was, I knew I, I knew I wasn't, I, I knew that I was the, the only places that I would be willing to be on the planet were San Diego, UCLA, Cal, Stanford, and Caltech. Those are the only things in my choice set. And the, and, and the reason and now, from my perspective, Stanford is the best of those options, but I've been perfectly happy at any of them, right? Because they were all great intellectual environments to be. And I was fortunate that, uh, you know, uh, Stanford, just the timing was, was perfect. Roger, what do you see as your key achievements as division chair of HSS? Women. By far, um, getting us extracted from the Jenny Joy fiasco, uh, hiring Eleanor Searle, hiring Jennifer Ranganum, getting Annette Smith pr promoted from lecturer. To tenured professor, I was proud of is going from a place where there were no women, well, one untenured woman on the tenure track faculty and all the rest lecturers to a world in which a significant fraction of the faculty is women. That was my single best achievement. Were you following when the undergraduates in 1969, 1970 were agitating for women to be oh, admitted yeah. to the undergraduate program? Oh, yeah. I was on their side. I'm a feminist. I've been one since the day I was born. <laughs> what was bittersweet? So, yeah, no, I, and I, you know, I, and I remember going to absolutely insane faculty meetings. Uh, circa, well, there was I, 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 there was a period when what's the there there. The, there's a woman's a Catholic woman's college that wanted to merge with Caltech. Do you remember the? What the I can't even remember, remember the name. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, I can't even remember the name. But we had some of the nutty. I think it was 69, 70, something like that. We had a couple of faculty meetings in which you you thought you 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 couldn't believe what you were hearing. <laughs> uh, the, the combination of woman and religious was just brought out the worst in so many of my colleagues. <laughs> but, you know, the, it, it, it was clear it was going to happen. The only issue was how long it would take and how painful it would be. What was bittersweet about leaving Caltech for you? Well, you know, I have great affection for Caltech as an institution. I, 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 there can't be very many of them. Uh, but um, my advice to someone like Bill Gates would, would have been instead of building computer science department buildings in your name at all of the top 20 universities, uh, start endow a couple of more Caltechs, small research oriented, 
uh, low student faculty ratio universities where um, this this but then the size of both the student body and the faculty is so small they're forced to work across boundaries um, minimal organizational obstructions and hierarchies um, you know i think the the intellectual environment of caltech is is just terrific and it's it's uh it's much harder to create those kinds of exciting weird uh radical departures from what everybody else is doing at a at a highly successful large research university like stanford i mean just to compare i mean stanford probably is the best university in the world right now and in terms of the average quality of everything it does but it does it by brute force right it has um the, the, all of silicon valley off of which to feed um uh, you know populated by its own its alumni and this who are incredibly generous to it but so it, it can it can waste an enormous amount of money caltech can't waste an enormous amount of money and uh and also everything is big it's on a broad big naggy in scale at stanford you know departments have 50 uh, that means that if you know the idea one of the projects i did at caltech was came out of a lunch i had at the athenaeum with uh, a geophysicist uh, and it was we ended up doing a project on earthquake prediction together and that just wouldn't happen here all right it just doesn't happen at stanford and it's because it, it, the, the probability that i would ever encounter someone in geophysics at stanford and and have a long discussion with them about what they were doing it, it's not that it's impossible here it's just that it's extremely unlikely because i have 75 colleagues i can talk to in my own field <laughs> <laughs> Why would I go to geophysics? <laughs> so I, that to me is, uh, you know, the idea of college in terms of scale is extremely attractive and intellectually useful. So I would, I would like to, I, I wish the world would be a better place if there were more Caltechs. Well, Roger, on that note, I'm so happy we were able to do this and capture all of your all of your recollections. Have you kept up with HSS over the years? Have you followed its oh, development? Yeah, no, I, I was just there. I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I, I, yeah, I go down there at least once a year. In fact, you know, I have several friends on the faculty there, um, some of whom I was an undergraduate with, like Kip Thorne and Gary Lorden. Oh, wow. And uh, I have former students who are on the faculty. Um, in fact, you know, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there at least once or twice a year. I hope we can have some kind of an anniversary celebration when one comes up. We can put all of this information together. It's a remarkable story. Roger, yeah. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure.